Happy December, Internet, and welcome to the Meteor Station Virtual Reality Podcast. I did realize that I should be mentioning the year for anyone binge listening down the line, so it's 2021, and Gruen and I have been sick, and Gruen is over here podcasting with a one-on-one fever like an absolute madman. So, <laughs> this podcast is going to be brought to you by the Sick Minds of Meteor Station. I, I'm kind of looking forward to it, though, honestly. It's going to be some fun delirium. And we do have a guest for this podcast, which is James A. Castillo, who wrote and directed Madrid Noir, so look forward to that. But that's enough of my voice. Let's get Gruen in here. You hanging in there, Gruen? What goes on in your world? Oh, I'm, I'm just enjoying the side effects of Dayquil and, and uh, <laughs> yeah, no, this is good. This is, you know, this is one of the good things about VR is that we can not infect each other, but we can be in the same room chatting. It feels like we're chatting in the same room, but... Yeah. Yeah, yeah and we don't have to pass the germs. Once they figure out how to do this and make the metaverse and then feed you, get you nutrition through the headset, then <laughs> you really won't have to leave your house and there's no reason you would ever get sick. Wait, that's the Matrix. Yeah, I was going to say, that sounds like, uh, is, is it Wally, the one where they're like floating around <laughs> in their little uh, <laughs> pods? And... Yeah, I think it's I, I like it. Yeah. I, I was ready to have you say like we can be in vr and give each other diseases still to keep it really accurate you know oh the sneeze simulator yeah yeah well hopefully they don't ever figure out how to infect (laughs) people with a virus on vr yeah (laughs) that's hopefully a feature that we can uncheck but yeah yeah uh for personal updates what goes on anything worth sharing the last month no, just working on a couple things for VR, uh, working on a kind of a funny uh, kids song and and nothing else yeah, cool. really exciting. Yeah, my update is similar to usual. I am still working on the dumpster shed when I can. Uh, I've had other things come up like, you know, Thanksgiving happened. That was fun. But I did uh, buy no. Pulsar. It's a VR, well, not a VR game. It's a VR friendly game. You can play it in VR. Uh, but some of my friends wanted to play it and it went on sale. So I have it. So at some point I'll be checking that out. It's kind of, my understanding is it's sort of similar to the Star Trek VR game. Like you get to captain a ship and go on missions and stuff. So I'll know more about it when I play it, but yeah, so that'll be a fun thing to try out. And we did record the, uh, interview on Monday which is that was my big sick day so i actually stepped out of the actual podcast you didn't have to hear me sneeze 24 7 but (laughs) you did in it you teased that we are hoping to at some point host a vr film festival which is good uh because we are looking to do that at some point so i'll just say i've been working on that a little bit and i mean i could I could host a garbage one sooner than later, but I want to host something actually good. (laughs) There are enough garbage festivals. I don't know if saying that's too spicy, but (laughs) uh, yeah, I'm going to try to develop something actually good. So it's going to be a little longer and the assets I'm using are breaking on me all the time, which is a little annoying, but no one wants to hear me nerd rage about assets so <laughs> we'll just keep on moving uh but the other thing i was working on was uh Grun and i are working on a board game we're actually working on multiple board games but one of them's coming pretty far along and it's a scary game i don't think we can share too much about it till we're ready to unleash it on the peoples but yeah it's coming along pretty well and hopefully we'll have more to share on that soonish so. Yeah, yeah, and and back to the festivals. The the big thing that I see about festivals is that there's always a big need for people to jump in and help. And you know, there's if if anybody out there has any experience or even just wants to be helpful, they should reach out to us. Yeah, I mean for sure. And that's a thing we mention a lot on the podcast in general. Is hey, we're happy to work with people. So. It, feels like a lot of people are out there trying to figure out who to work with and we're here and we'll at least chat with you see if there's some compatibility on something we can do together we have a lot of cool projects in the work so yeah yeah i'd love to work with uh some of these projects somehow get connected to uh some of these studios that james castillo's involved with 
And I think, you know, I don't want to spoil anything, but anybody interested in VR and animation and, you know, just the VR entertainment industry at all is is probably going to get a few really good tips from this interview. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, we'll get more into that maybe after the interview so we can do our little wrappy up bit, but... Do you want to do a little bit of news and then we can just jump right into the interview? Because it is a pretty long interview, so we should probably keep this bit a little shorter than usual. Yeah, yeah, and it's almost time for more Dayquil, so... (laughs) Dayquil time. It's a magical time of the year. Speaking of, it's almost Christmas. We should be wearing Christmas hats right now. What are we doing? Ooh, yeah. The fools we are. Okay, let's jump out and get back in with Christmas attire. Perfect. I am now wearing a Santa hat in real life. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, what did you see too. in the news? Um, well, I thought, I don't know if you saw this, but the, the folks that built uh, Pokemon Go, I forget the name of that company, but they got... Niantic. They had $300 million to build a real world metaverse. So Facebook talks like they're the only people that are working on this. Obviously, other people are working on this. I bet Facebook is panicked at their <laughs> facility right now. Like, uh, everybody create a fun little character, like a weird little animal character. Hurry, you know, just so they can <laughs> compete. <laughs> but, but what I don't, I don't want to be in a metaverse where like Pikachu is on my shoulder telling me what to do and introducing me, me to things or, or Charizard is <laughs> in the little cubicle next to me at work or anything. I don't know. If we get to do the full Pokemon works, that'd be fun. I don't think that's the goal, though. But it's kind of funny, because I actually think... I, I've been really unimpressed with Niantic. I tried Pokemon Go when it first came out, and if people remember when it came out, it was a disaster. It was just... that had so many problems, and honestly, the app itself is really simple. It's just like superimposing a Pokemon with your camera and saying, hey, look, it's AR, which I do not think is really the same thing. It didn't really do anything too crazy. So I think that's a weird choice for a company. I'm kind of curious why they're being picked. But uh, yeah, if I were Facebook, hopefully it does motivate them a little bit. I, I'd bet on them over Antic, but I don't know. The competition's always healthy. I, I, like I've said before, I kind of wish they would just collaborate more than anything like everyone just build stuff that's cool and can all work together facebook builds one thing niantic builds another you know that kind of thing right if they all work together that's that's going to make it the best um there there was also a story about um have you ever played a game called cities it's like you build cities and they, they're mm-hmm. coming out with a game called cities vr so you can build cities which you know a little it looks more complex than Minecraft or something like that. But you could use a tool like that in the metaverse. So all these companies work together and they'll, that's going to be the best thing. If if one company tries to control it, that's going to be the worst. Anyway, another thing that I saw in the news was the, uh, somebody developed indoor GPS for, uh, I believe just augmented reality. But so if you're in the grocery store, you can say, like, where are the potatoes? And it'll say they're right behind you, uh, three feet. Yeah. Okay, that makes... Yeah, what you said, indoor GPS is like, it It works indoors with what? But yeah, that's yeah. cool. That's cool, yeah. It, well, you think, I, I thought it was kind of ridiculous because, like, if you're in a store, I know there are times where you're looking for something and you can't find it, but you oh, know, yeah. if there's, there's something that says it's on aisle 23. I mean, that should be good enough. You don't... If everyone's walking around looking at their phone, following directions <laughs> on how to get to the pinto beans, you know, it's just everyone's going to run into each other. And I don't know. <laughs> seems seems a little extreme to me. I don't know. Uh, I, I can see it especially being useful in, like, for instance, a foreign country where you're wanting to go find something and everything's in a different language than you understand or something. You know, something like that. Or, yeah. I mean, for me, Home Depot, I can never find someone to show me where stuff is. So, uh, yeah. you know, something like that. Just where is the gap filler? Interesting, though. Yeah, there's uh, money cool. flowing. Yeah. I, I don't know how much money they raised for this thing, but it's like, you know, there's there's money flowing into these things that yeah. I just don't see. But, yeah. Yeah, we'll have to see what... And if you ever need help at Home Depot, I can tell you where everything is. I've got it memorized. <laughs> Honestly, I believe you. 
Yeah. I, I, <laughs> so your money thing makes me think of one of the things I saw, which was Samsung is building an AR app. I think they already launched it. It's called Dream Ground. And it does look pretty cool, but it made me think of it because they're so confusing because they were the ones that built and pushed Gear VR and they had their own little app for everything where you could go see some cool VR experiences and stuff. And then they just, they were like pushing Gear VR where you could get it free with certain purchases and stuff at times and then it just disappeared and it's like they're just popping in and out and like discontinuing things and it's it's just interesting that now they're back and building this ar thing so i don't know i guess we'll see what comes of that because for that i just i don't even know what they're gonna do maybe they'll sell like now you can have a charizard on your shoulder or whatever you said (laughs) i don't know yeah yeah that was a thing yep so another thing I saw was Ultra Leap is this hand tracking thing, and they've done this Gemini version, I guess. And I was seeing a demo video, and it's looking really cool and impressive. So the idea of this stuff is you just have your hand out in front of you, and it can tell exactly what it's doing, where it is in space. And so you can press buttons, grab joysticks, just interact with everything with just your hands. And at first I was thinking, you know, it's kind of funny that some groups are working on haptics and stuff where you're adding more stuff to your body, like bigger gloves and whatnot, so that you can feel like you're touching things. But then I actually went to their site, and they have a haptic section. And so I I had to check that out, because it was like, well, it's kind of weird that they're doing this nothing on your hands, no controllers or whatever, uh, but they have haptics. And so their haptics are, I don't know how that works, but it's like you have your hands mid-air and somehow it makes your hands like vibrate like they're touching something. And it looks pretty cool. It's one of those things where it's like, I obviously COVID's been happening, so we haven't gotten to go to any like VR conventions or tech conventions where they'd show this kind of stuff off. But it's one of those things where it's like, I, I want to see how this thing works or what it actually feels like, because it seems pretty cool. So you'd be able to actually just potentially get to have no gloves, no controllers, and just feel like you're touching stuff. But I mean, even without the haptic thing, I could see this tech being really good for AR in particular. Seems like everything I'm seeing for it was VR so far, but like just having your hands out there perfectly tracked makes perfect sense for AR. But yeah, so that was kind of neat. So we should probably reach out to those folks and see if we can get them here to talk to us. Maybe we can test it out and chat with them on the Meteor. That'd be fun. Yeah, for sure. Maybe I could help them out a bit because I can already put my hand in front of my face and see them. And I don't know why they're having trouble. Yeah. (laughs) yeah you're amazing that's all there really is to it (laughs) but yeah relevant to the haptics and whatnot i was seeing this post on this breakdown of the different prices vr users would be willing to pay for headsets or haptics and whatnot and i was kind of surprised like if the data's at all accurate people are willing to spend more than i would have guessed i you know, the the VR community seems a little more frugal than I was initially kind of thinking, because I mean, it's for a lot of users, it's, you know, it's for fun. And so it's not like, it's not food. (laughs) It's not something you have to buy. So I was kind of surprised when it felt like, you know, people are a little more frugal than I thought, but people seem to be willing to spend on, you know, if you're in VR, willing to spend on better experiences so better headsets or uh haptics and all that kind of stuff so it's just kind of neat because like i said if it's accurate then people will be able to the companies that are investing in this kind of stuff will be able to at least recoup their investments if not actually make some money off it and have it be worthwhile to make better and better stuff which is great for everybody so that was cool and also relevantly valve is still investing big money into headsets and games and whatnot, and they are the ones that made Half-Life Alex, which I think could be pretty well argued as the best VR game. Well, I guess I don't know that. I <laughs> I would probably argue that. I'd actually be pretty curious what people do think of as the best VR game. 
Uh, what would you say, VR paintball, rec room? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm pretty pretty easy. Just any kind of uh, multiplayer shoot 'em up game. Just for overall quality and experience, and Half Life Alex was amazing. That would be cool if they could somehow make it. Like, if they had a co op mode, that would be amazing for Half Life Alex. That'd be really cool. But yeah, leave us a comment. What is the best VR game in your opinion? Thank you. Polling the audience. And then one other quick thing I just thought was kind of interesting was, so <laughs> I saw an article on a game called Gorilla Tag, which it's it sounds like it's legit just tag. I haven't played it. It's free, so anyone could check it out. But uh, it was made by some solo dev, and it's kind of funny. It was talking about, like, now he's making big boy money. But the thing I was finding interesting, and I'll try not to get too nerdy on it, was he was saying, like, before he could get in-app purchases in on the Quest, uh, all the profits from Steam were being eaten by server costs, which I've always been kind of curious about that because they're legit just free games, not even in-app purchase games. And I, I just don't understand how to i like how people manage to do that unless it's just like i don't know if if you only have to spend some minimal amount like five or ten bucks a month maybe they just don't care so that's fine but just, how do how do people keep a free multiplayer game alive without any income so uh, well, anyway, gorilla tag. So is this a, is that a multi multiplayer game gorilla tag yeah it, it's like just tag but your gorillas and apparently they're 1.5 million people playing this thing, so it's wow, pretty popular. Yeah, ah, a lot of people like it. Out. Yeah, it's probably interesting, largely for the social experience of it. But yeah, that's all I had for news. You want to go talk to James A. Castillo? Yeah, I think I'll go downstairs and talk to him. Yeah, and like I said, I was sick for this part, so I skipped out. I was just there in the background recording these guys, but I think it's a good interview. So here you go. We have with us today James Castillo, and uh, why don't we just start with, with, I know you've probably had to do this a hundred times, you probably have that one minute bio that you have to repeat all the time, but that'll give us a good starting point. So my name is James, I, I am a illustrator, designer, director, I've, I've worked mostly in, uh, in uh, film and TV and advertising for animation, uh, and over a few, like three or four years ago, I started getting very interested in VR and I made friends with the guys from the studio No Ghost and we started sort of discussing first in a very theoretical so just pandering to the universe like questions about what we saw like what would be interesting to do in VR and that led to us uh, uh, you know so developing this project into what what now is a 45 minute narrative with some interaction uh, film in VR Excellent. Yeah, and that's Madrid Noir is how you say it, right? Yes. Yes. So, correct. and Madrid Noir is like a film experience that is in VR, and it's been out for a month. Is that right? A little bit more. Uh, well, on a Steam, yeah, for about a month. But it's been out in the market since June, I believe. So it's been a it's been a bit already, which is exciting because yeah. now we see it and it sort of becoming just part of the of the ether and, and it's really nice to sort of see people slowly discovering it and, and how it, it's really it's really cool. And it's it's in a bunch of festivals, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It got it got premiered in Tribeca in New York and then it went straight to Cannes in France and Annecy. Annecy is a little well not a little it's a big animation festival that happens in France every year. And now um we are very, very it, Proud that uh, Madrid Noir got the the best experience of the year award at the VR Awards this year, That's just great. about a couple of weeks ago, which is very exciting. Uh, and then we also were in Renda in Rain Dance, and we've been to a festival in Taiwan. Like now, the, the like the movie's traveling a lot. It's going to Taiwan. It was in Canada and LA, London. It just keeps moving around. Um, yeah, it's really exciting. And did you go to any of those? Festivals? Nah, I, I well, in person. Unfortunately, most of them we couldn't. We we couldn't go to Tribeca, which really was heartbreaking. But um, yeah. I managed to go to Annecy because it's it's really close to London, and 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 I've been going for many years, so I, I managed to go to that one. 
Uh, and that's about it. All the other festivals, we couldn't go because of COVID restrictions or they right. were just canceled or the, they were doing a, a virtual event. So for the VR Awards, for example, we did a, a something like this in, um, what do you call it, Allspace. Um, so there was like a big mm-hmm. ceremony on Allspace. And then for Raindance, it was a, a VR chat ceremony. So it's this weird, it's a strange year where VR is, is, is sort of, like all these festivals happen in VR, which is very fitting yeah. because it's what we, yeah. what we were doing in the first place. But it does sort of take away a little bit from the excitement of being with your peers in a new country, you know, sort of seeing the celebration of this industry and being able to chat with people and, and get to know yeah. everybody's face, you know. Yeah, and maybe running into Robert De Niro or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that would have been nice. <laughs> I kept fantasizing with my friends that maybe I, like, I would just pretend to go to the bathroom whenever he was there to just to bump into him. I saw him at a restaurant one time and he was eating with his friends. And I went to the bathroom and just walked right by his table right next to him just on purpose. But I don't think he cared. Yeah. No, of course not. They they have much bigger things to, to think about than, than us. Yes. Okay, yeah. so, yeah, Madrid Noir. Let's talk about that just a little bit. If, yeah, let's go for it. Uh, or a lot. So did you come up with that idea or did somebody else? That was my original idea. I, it, it went through a lot of iteration. I, I, cannot, I cannot say that with a straight face. I need to uh, um, point out that the, 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 the team at No Ghost is as responsible as I am for the VM product and the story that we did. But originally, I came up with this very simple idea that was um, I came up, I came from are directing a another VR film called Melita that came out like five or six years ago. And that one had a very cinematographic look to it. And and I kept thinking that that it was really cool, but I felt that that like it wasn't the best language to translate into VR because all the limitations that ha- that come with not being able to frame the the image or compose the image or do the, or doing the editing yourself because you are relinquished so not so you are, you are giving the control of the camera to the player you don't really have, have that that amount of control and i think any time that you want to get that back you end up with a product that doesn't quite embrace the medium and i i felt mm-hmm. That the the language of theater would be much more easy to translate to VR than cinema, and that was the first inkling of the idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, then after that, I am from Madrid originally, so I, I wanted to honor the city because I felt that it would be it would make it would give it a first it would make it more genuine because I I, I could do something that other people had, couldn't do, um, and also I want I knew I wanted to do a genre film. And my first instinct was to maybe do it in New York or Chicago or places like that that you were also used to seeing in film. Um, but I felt that maybe bringing it to a city like Madrid would give it that element of of foreign, of uh, exotic, of interesting, something that is 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 recognizable as as the 30s or the 40s, but it had a different taste to it. Um, originally, mm-hmm. I was a little bit afraid that that might be alienating to some people, but on the contrary, it sort of become one of the reasons why most people are interested in the project is is because of of that portrayal of the of the city. And then I, I came with that idea to the guys at No Ghost, and and my idea originally was much much simpler. It was something like in the lines of the pan- the Pink Panther, for example, like the bad guy kidnaps the little dog. And the, the the detective has to chase the bad guy and rescue the dog. That was my only idea. It was something much more simple and tiny. But then, as we kept discussing the idea, as we as people came became interested in the project, Atlas Five, Oculus, all these different investors, the project demanded to grow. And then, as we were growing the project, we realized that we had to make a much more nuanced and layered story. And that's where the character of Lola came by, Lola came, came in. And then we created that character as a way of, of creating conflict with Manolo, with the, with the uncle. And then that became this generational conflict between these two characters. And that became sort of the root of the story. And as we kept working on the story with, with me, Lawrence, who comes from Nogos, and then Lydia, who's the other writer of the project, we kind of started building the story that now is, is, is film. But, but yeah, it was, it was quite the, the, journey, mm-hmm. the creative journey to just sort of putting together some basic pieces and then allowing it to grow in directions that I wasn't originally sure whether that was going to 
work or not, but then sort of mm-hmm. having faith on people that knew how VR worked, like the guys from No Ghost and experienced writers yeah. like Lydia, really ended up like creating this very interesting chemistry where I could bring all the stuff that I know about storytelling and design and animation and then Nogos could bring all the knowledge from VR and Lydia could bring all the or knowledge in story and then we kind of this sort of alchemy happened where where this hybrid project came out came, came to be yeah and that I think that's a lot of projects in the entertainment industry they they might start one way and then they finish completely different. But in animation, I think it's unique that now you can allow it to grow and change where like the, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, all that animation that was done, you couldn't veer from the script because you had people drawing this exact thing that you need. You couldn't change it midway. Well, that absolutely, completely. And then I think in that, in, In regards to what you just said, I think my biggest shock was realizing how as challenging as VR can be, developing an anime project in in um, real in in a real time engine like Unreal became very liberating because it gives you it creates a much more dynamic process where you can start changing things on the fly and you can be much more um, you can um, sorry what's the word looking for. uh, adapt, uh, you can, yeah, you can adapt. You can you, you can generate ideas much faster. You can test things out, and it creates a very dynamic workflow, which is something that in animation has always been so rigid because it requires so many departments and it requires this sort of perfect execution and passing through the assignments to different departments. That once you lock on the story and the storyboard, that's the movie, and then you just has you have two years of getting it to a final to, to the final look. Whereas right. in this case, until the very the last few months or the last few weeks even, we were already adjusting and we were realizing how, look, if you looked at this for this angle, it's much more interesting, it's more dynamic. How can we make this scene a little bit more um, immersive? Can we add something to the lighting? And until the very last mm-hmm. minute, we were changing the story. And that is something that I don't think is, is, can be done in any other medium. So I'm very, right. I'm very interested on seeing how the animation industry starts adapting the real time engine um, possibilities because that's going to create some very interesting workloads. That yeah. So you start talking about the tools that you use. So you use Unreal Engine, mm-hmm. and I think there might be people listening that that are hoping that maybe they're already in the industry, maybe they are looking to get into the industry or like us, we we do animation, but on a small scale. And mm-hmm. what are the tools that you use Unreal Engine and then and what else is like the well, must to be have? honest, the, the pipeline, yeah. So in that regard, the pipeline was very similar to any animated production. So all the art department would use um, just Photoshop or even just you know, pencil and paper to figure everything out to do all the design work or the drawing. We did try to to use um, Quill to try to sketch out the spaces, but we realized, unfortunately, that because none of us really had the time to learn the tool properly, it was becoming a little bit cumbersome to use. But I do believe that for in the future, if I come back again to the VR space to create something, I would like to get more accustomed to Quill, because I think that that's a great tool that anybody doing stuff in VR or even video games or even 2D animation can really use and really um, exploit. But then in terms mm-hmm. of the technical side of things, we did all the modeling, texturing on Maya and all the animation and rigging. So Maya became our powerhouse to do all the pre-production of the 3D stuff and then all the implementation, all the lighting, all that stuff happened in um, Unreal Engine. But okay. it was Maya and Unreal. That was it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you aren't working on any VR projects now, but you have something planned for the future for VR? Well, yeah, I have a bunch of ideas. I think the guys from No Ghost and I, we now have a very close relationship and we, we, they are also very creative. So they have some ideas that they, that they, that they run through me and I have some ideas that I write through them. And I think as, as we see, 
um, the industry changing. I think now with the, especially with the announcement of the metaverse by, by the guys from Facebook and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure there'll be plenty of news next year about new players into these this space we'll see what what will be interesting to do in vr next but we definitely have some mm -hmm. ideas that 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 could be done in vr we just need a bit of time to work them out yeah you don't want to tell anybody anything that's super secret but do you have anything you could share that's a spoiler no i, I think I'll, at the moment <laughs> no the only thing i I'm, I'm sorry i wish i wish i mean uh, some people have been asking about doing more madrid noir like a sequel to the story or continuing the story and we definitely have ideas on how we would do that um and we've sort of sketched those out and and and, and develop them a little bit but but that there's so many elements that that go that are beyond our control when it comes to to funding financing product like all the production stuff that we, we have it ready whenever the industry is ready to sort of uh, talk about it and, and, and the people are interested in, um, we'll, we'll take it to the next step. But for now, everything is very much like on, on a folder in our studio. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so your your background is art. That's where you got your start, mm -hmm. right? You, you were an artist yeah. first. And so where did you get your first experience with VR that you said, okay, I need to do something with this? Yeah, I I came from I started out in doing mobile games uh, stuff like ten years ago, and I that led to me me learning a little bit of the pipeline of of video games and and with that I started um, I moved to London and I started working on animation and some of the people that I met while I was working in video games um, I started developing this project called Melita in Madrid and at that time. I think it's about when the when the when the Rift two I think was out, and at that time Google Spotlight had been making some 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 very cool movies in, in virtual reality, and I saw them for the first time in LA in an event called CTN. It's like an animation convention that happens in LA every year, and I remember seeing it. I saw Pearl, I believe it was. The one with the the dad and the mm. and, and his, his child on the car, and I remember seeing that for the first time in a headset. It was my first experience in a headset ever, mm. and it truly like it, I became very excited about the, the potential for it because I I was seeing directors and artists that are very experienced sort of taking what they know and trying to tell stories on this medium, and I fell in love with the idea of of what that could be. Um, so that and then when the guys from from Madrid that were doing Melita came and they said we want you to art direct this project, I at that point I was really excited about it and I, was, I I jumped at the opportunity to do it and that's when I started sort of seeing because one thing is to see what somebody has made in VR and just appreciating all the hard work and artistry and a very different thing is to have a script and then start figuring it out how how do you frame the scenes in VR so everything is understood because you don't have close-ups so you don't have you know editing you cannot move the camera really too much because it makes you sick so it was that was my first time trying to work out artistically how do you mm -hmm. present a scene in a way that favors the story and, and it's not distracting or it's not uh, you know it's not too to uh oh look like it doesn't break the pace because sometimes in vr for example because you have to sort of fade to black and then from black from scene to scene and sometimes you are moving the player from different angles of the different locations it can be very distracting and if you have to follow a story but you every few seconds you have to stop for two or three seconds for the player to be able to know understand where they are you are losing out of the uh, timing and the pacing and that's also one of the reasons why in Madrid Noir we, we did the theater thing because it allows us to be much faster and just move quick without anybody losing track of what's going on. But that was my first experience. Um, I directed Milita. And then from there, I started just working um, on it and started working on my project and, and writing different different ideas and then just mm -hmm. uh, exploring and, and prototyping ideas for the project with the guys from Nergos. Well, and I'll say the the art work for madrid noir is so good it's worth getting just just to see what you guys did in the surroundings oh, and the thanks man. just it's it's beautiful and so you but you've done some animation with some of the big studios like dreamworks and paramount and sony and 
and then the Google I.O. stuff. And so you've worked in all these different areas. I would imagine you like doing kind of a combination of of everything is is there do you have a preference of working in flat animation and yeah i th- VR? well it's a very it's different because also every movie or every project is is very different in a style or even the like all the 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 the, the way it presents itself um like i worked on this movie for sony called mitchell's versus the machines which has yeah. a very unique look to it. And that required mm-hmm. a lot of exploration and um, from part of the director and the art on the brand, the production designer. And it was really just interesting to see that develop in, and create its own language. And I think, I don't know if I have a preference, but I do definitely are, I'm attracted to projects that, that, that have to, how can I say this? Um, that are taking a medium and that, and like kind of finding a way to, to, to make a twist or to to have on on how to 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 tell a story with it, and I'm definitely much more story driven than I am tech or medium driven. I think I'm more attracted to the creative team behind a project or the story they want to tell, and then whether that's in VR or it's 2D or it's a movie or it's a TV show or it's a a commercial that that's irrelevant. I think it's more, much more always the the vision and the story and. Then the medium yeah. comes second. Like some of the stories that I'm that I'm working on at the moment, some of them I know are are not for VR. Some of them I'm kind of like, well, I will have to change it, but it would be interesting to see something like this done in VR. But I'm not sort of closing my mind on on one or the other. I'm kind of very open to whichever medium works best to for the story. Um, I'll go that way. Yeah. Well, especially with what they're doing with the Star Wars series, that they're filming a lot of that mm. using the VR tactics. It's not yeah. actually released in VR, but they're using VR to film. The one, one project you did, I think Three Below, you did with Guillermo del Toro, right? Yeah, I worked, uh, uh, I, my friends, um, I have some friends that were sort of the, the studio behind a lot of the character design um, elements for that show. And I, and I worked with them for a couple of months um, supporting that show. That kind of came out of nowhere, but it became a very, a very um, fulfilling experience um, working with that team. I think that show is something that nobody sort of knew whether that like it was going to be that successful. And then it became a whole thing and they made a movie and it's become more one of the biggest Netflix shows. Um, I mean, I, I, I mean, the whole Troll Hunters um, um, project. Um, that was really yeah. fulfilling. That was really cool. Yeah. I only I only bring that up because I wanted to find out if you got to meet him. Nah, no, unfortunately not. No. Um, he doesn't have time. <laughs> no, for, yeah. for freelancers. Yeah. No. Okay, so I, I do like to find out um, just uh, any celebrity meetings that you've had. Have you met any big celebrities in your work uh wow um well I, i've met people that are known within my industry but um i think in terms of celebrities um i don't know it would be hard to pinpoint to anybody other than i live in london so fortunately there's a lot of theater going on here and a lot of filming so every now and then i've bumped into somebody in the streets and that has been sort of quite bizarre i remember the i met i met i i bumped into um jk simmons um, who's mm-hmm. the actor behind Whiplash, and he's also yeah. uh, has a role in the Spider-Man movies and all that. And yeah. that, that was quite. That was quite. I I remember. I I got very excited. <laughs> and I could tell that he yeah. was quite afraid of me making a scene, but I just I managed to to just talk to him for for just five minutes. Uh, but that's about it. I mean, it's in in our industry, it's a lot of hardworking people. I think the our contact with the, the more celebrity world is, is more for the directors and the and the producers than it is for the designers. I think now that I'm, if I get to keep writing projects and, the, and direct projects, maybe in the future I, I get to work directly with, with some of them, but that's not, that's not um, up to me really. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a, um, it's, it's fun when you bump into somebody like that and you just, yeah. uh, yeah, I've I've had that happen where you can tell they're not sure of what you're going to do, but you, know, <laughs> yeah. you don't want to you don't want to annoy them, but it's kind of fun to meet somebody. Maybe if you did a project where you get to 
decide who does the voiceovers and then insist on certain people that you've always wanted to meet to do voiceovers and then yeah, you get to maybe. work with them. And I understand with the the different, the VR and the flat animation and all that, it does. Sometimes we do the same thing. We're like, you know, why do it in VR unless it really brings something to the project? But right. uh, um, I wanted to get back to the festivals. So on the festivals, because we actually are talking about putting together a VR festival. Um, Pro, oh, cool. It probably won't be for two years because it takes a lot of work and a lot yeah, of behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. yeah and then you have to have time to have people submit. And uh, so have you seen anything in the festivals that you liked or didn't like or, you know, anything that you would? Yeah. Uh, well, that's, the inter that's interesting. I think it's it's definitely the artist is starting to get its its place in all the major festivals. I think from Sundance to the Toronto Film Festival to Cannes to CGES to uh, the Venice Film Festival has a massive VR uh, section. It's all, like, it's there, so it's been appreciated. I do think that there is definitely space for, uh, if, like, festivals that might be a little bit more um, industry-specific. I know the VR awards um, are, are really cool because they, they do... They they are one of the few festivals that actually has categories because most of these most of these festivals, like for example, Madrid Noir would be on the same category as David Attenborough's documentary and also like uh, a video game, right? Because it's just one one um, category is VR and that includes every every possible thing that can be done in VR. So that's a bit. Mm -hmm. It's always a little bit unfair because that's just like. You know, it's like putting Toy Story and, and Pulp Fiction to compete with one another. It makes no, no sense, right? So it's one of those things where I think definitely the industry requires or festivals like, you know, any new festivals that are much more specific and, and whose categories are, are very well defined and they understand the process so they can talk about um, like the, the art within, like, you know, the art within different projects, whether that's a game, whether like the best game of the year, the best, the best animated project of the year, the best narrative, the best documentary, the best. And you can break, break it down into, into ways that feels more fair because I'd also like to highlight all the people that like, it's very easy to, to focus on the art because it's very visual or even this, or even the music, like the best music for a VR project, a VR project would be interesting. But also the, the the studios and the developers behind it, um, like like happens in a lot of like game award where where they like the 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 writers and the and the the developers do get to to you know to be on the spotlight and to be highlighted as, as contributors of the industry, which I think at the moment is kind of missing because all, basically all the directors and producers get all the all the cloud. Where I think there's a lot of behind the scenes that would be great to highlight. The one festival mm -hmm. that I think you should look into that does have a little bit more representation is the Rain Dance Film Festival. Um, it happens in London mm -hmm. every year. Um, and they have the Rain Dance Indi Independent Film Festival, and then they have the Rain, the Rain Dance Immersive. Um, but that's only, it's in Europe. I don't know, or I don't believe there's anything in the US like it. So maybe there's, there's, there's a place there to get, um, mm. to move it. Yeah, I've seen I've seen their festival out there, but I I don't know. Yeah, I, I didn't know they were kind of unique in that way. But I'll check that out. Yeah, um, yeah definitely next year. Check it out. Yeah, and uh, maybe we'll have something to submit. We're working on a couple things that we might be able to submit to something like that as well. Oh, nice. So for people that are listening and again just whether they're in it or they're starting or interested when you get your start you have a lot of connections now that will keep building of course but for somebody just starting out where do you start where do you get connections is it agencies is it just going oh, you mean to in, in vr oh vr I, uh, in my case yeah yeah i i remember since I, when I got my first contract in a, in a, a little gaming game studio in, in Barcelona in Spain, I remember like I would, all the money that I would save, I would sort of invest it on, on, on myself. I would, I would pay for courses, I would pay for classes, and then every year I would try to go to um, industry events 
that happened. Um, there was this one very big one that happens in France in the Annecy Film Festival. There's definitely the CTN in LA. There's the there's the Trojan Horse in uh, Portugal. So there's worldwide there's, there's there's all these different festivals that happen where they bring you know very good talent and and very um, known um, uh, pr- uh, professionals. So they got, uh, and and I would basically just travel on my own. I would be 24, so I would just like travel to LA on my own, knowing anyone. But you you do it a few times, and it's, it's daunting and it's scary. But then the third time, the fourth time, you start realizing that there's a lot of people like you that you yeah, you keep seeing in the same events that are they're all starting out, and you go with your portfolio and you go with your ideas and you talk to them, and people tend to be extremely extremely open. Um, about feedback and about their careers and and so everybody's very approachable so i would recommend anybody to fight the that um potential shyness that we all have that we all have uh, and to try to invest a couple of years of their of their savings if they are lucky enough to be able to save you know i understand that that's not possible to everybody but to to then to, to travel to put themselves in a, in, a, in a situation with someone where they can ask them questions and learn about the industry i think if if you go straight to the studios or you go straight to the to the agencies, you you miss out a little bit on the on the human element of of the industry, which I think is the most important thing. I I've been I've benefited much more from the friends that I've been making in the industry just by being in the events and talking to them than than I have from um you know approaching agencies or or studios really because then you know people tend to be to be very kind and they recommend you and they keep you know and they and that i think is how you start building a portfolio because at the beginning it feels quite scary and 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 even um it's easy to feel the scared uh but i think it it really pays off yeah well we should include maybe some links that would tell people some of these gatherings if you can point us to a couple of those we'll yeah. include the link for your your website that shows the work that you've done anything else that you'd want oh, to you. promote coming up or anything well i would definitely like to if you could uh link people to nogo the studio that that may you know i think they they are someone if you're in europe if you're in england especially they are a studio that is that is it's getting to do some very interesting stuff and they're growing a lot and they they are very cool guys they and they're very um, easy to to, to approach. I, I would love for them to be a little bit on the spotlight. And then, what else? Um, yeah, I think just to let everybody know that Madrid Noir is, is on Steam and the Oculus Store as well. Um, if anybody's interested to see it, um, they can go and get it. I think it's on it's it's on the um, on the sales at the moment. It's on sale, so it's a little bit cheaper than it normally is. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely would recommend that. We'll link to all those things and we'll. We'll have that up. And then I've got one last question, which is the really deep uh, journalistic question that's going to put you on the spot. Go for it. Yeah. Your social media name is Murfish. Please explain. (laughs) Uh, That's just one of those things. Um, I, I, you know, when I was younger, like my my last name is Murphy. So my name, my full name is James Castillo Murphy. Um, my mom is Irish. So in Spain, it's, it's quite rare to meet someone with a last name Murphy. So it became my nickname through my, my entire, like the moment I, like, I went to primary school, everybody started calling me Murphy uh, all through my life. And then that started, you know, every so often somebody would come up with a variation on it just to annoy me. And, and a very close friend of mine um, kept calling me Murphy all the time. And when I started um, sort of existing professionally online, I realized that there is another James Castillo that is an animator that works in Canada. Um, so I, uh-huh. that's why I put the A sometimes. Uh, and I go for yep. that name because I used it on Twitter, I used it on Instagram. It's sort of most people know me by that name anyway, so I just kind of carry it on. Um, but it was to, to differentiate myself a little bit from, from this other person that that has that that name i actually have been in, yeah. in in productions where my like they would give me an email and it would get messed up mixed up messed up because they on their system there's already a different james castillo which is this other guy uh, that i never yeah. met 
And I don't know, like, I'm hoping, I cannot wait for the moment I show up in an event and I meet this other James Castillo. It'd be great. Yeah. Um, That's yeah. funny. Well, that explains <laughs> it. Yeah. It, yeah. I, I figured yeah. there was some story behind it. So, well, that's that's great. I definitely encourage people to see Madrid Noir and all your other stuff. You also Thank have you. Uh, a, a link to your uh, your gnome project, which I assume is why you picked a gnome for your avatar. Oh well, no, you mean the um, yeah? I worked. <laughs> I actually did it, but it doesn't make sense. Uh, no, I worked on uh, on this movie called uh, Sherlock Gnomes. Um, yeah, years ago. Um, I picked That's a gnome because it was it had an angry face and I thought it was funny and I was like, sure, I didn't this. <laughs> it was this or a banana. I, there was no, other, I didn't know what to get. Um, yeah. yeah, and that's for people that are watching this on YouTube because we're we're on the regular podcast platforms, but then also YouTube and and people can enjoy it either way. And if you're just listening <laughs> to it, you could jump on YouTube and and check out his avatar. And but but uh, I appreciate you coming. We'll we'll definitely have to talk and make sure we've got links to everything because you've got so much yeah, good of stuff course. to look at. Anytime. It's been a pleasure. So to thank be you. Here, guys. Thank you so much. Of course. Awesome. Anytime. So that was James A. Castillo. And if you listen to the interview, you know why he has to have the A in there. He also learned a few things about VR entertainment industry, VR animation. And uh, I, th I think he is, uh, some of the tools that he uses, I think that was all very helpful for anybody looking to get into that world. Yeah. Uh, so Unreal, I'm very, very interested in MetaHuman. So that's something I've been wanting to pick up anyway. So hearing that, you know, they've got all this flexibility and it works so well and all that from using Unreal. I'm almost definitely going to be picking that up soon. I just happen to have like 800 projects on my plate at all times. So I don't know when I'm going to do that, but I'm going to do that at some point and it'll be cool. So, but yeah, a lot of good stuff in there. And uh, not gonna lie, I'm, I'm kind of jealous that he gets to work with a studio that does the animating for him because we have all these ideas, but we have to then do it because it's, you know, it's just us. So uh, we've been over time developing our skills. And so at any point, we like to make whatever the best thing we can make with what we know how to do. And I guess we haven't really shared very much of that because I'm referring to stuff like Jelly which is like a full 8K 360 degree cartoon or Starloaf, which is a claymation in VR and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And with the What Did I Just Watch movie that's in the works, uh, which is more of a 3D model kind of thing. But yeah, it'd be so cool to have a studio just, here's my idea go because <laughs> yeah i haven't been able to I, I have some actually really cool ideas that i'm just legitimately unable to put together with my current skill set so yeah no you can get a lot more done when you have 100 people ready to do whatever you've yeah, thought of they're that big but very true still yeah so yeah what were your big takeaways with the interview well just uh how he got into this it's it's not an overnight thing and i think for anybody trying to get into it it's you know making connections i thought that was helpful like go to go to vr conferences and gatherings when you're able to in vr or in person and make connections and then um you'll you just start with this group and just um i always hear people in that world that say you you just say yes if somebody says hey do you want to jump in and help us do this one thing and and just say yes and then you never know you you know that could lead to the yeah. next thing yeah for sure agreed and i guess for me since i did listen to it and all that so i was there in spirit but <laughs> one of my takeaways was he was talking about the media evolving over time like how he had this much simpler idea and he and the studio were kind of going back and forth and it the animation kind of evolved as they were putting it together and they were able to do it pretty easily with, you know, they were working closely together and using Unreal, which I guess helped with being able to tweak it on the fly and stuff. But I just kind of thought that was really interesting because like you guys were talking about, it kind of evolved, the process evolved into that where you could have your project itself evolve which I kind of think is really weird 
for it's not weird so it's cool for a smaller studio that can just you know make things better and better on the fly like this but i think for like hollywood it's weird that it works like that now because they've got these huge budgets and they end up shooting all this extra footage and stuff that are like they're just deleting full scenes and it's like how do you not just have like with all your millions of dollars, how do you not just have like this incredible script and know that this scene doesn't need to happen? I, I just, I don't know. I, I mean, I, for sure I get like for Hollywood, you'd want like this lead in shot versus this lead in shot versus this one and see which one lands best or like cutting a scene different ways. But yeah, uh, <laughs> other than that, I don't really see how like the really big dogs that don't have the small studio vibe where you can just closely work with each other and be like, what if we tried this? Yeah, I don't know. It's just kind of interesting. So I thought uh, I thought that conversation was interesting. It's all in the evolution of things. Even in film, you know, they used to use expensive film, and so a movie, you couldn't just do 100 takes because that just, it would cost so much money because you're burning through this expensive film. And now right. the way they do it digitally, you can have Will Ferrell uh, try a hundred different funny lines and then you just use the best one. Right, yeah. And I guess that's a good point for the more improvised movies where I, I don't know how improvised. I'm actually really curious about that because, I mean, you see outtakes from him like from Zoolander or whatever and they're all hilarious. Like, <laughs> they have to pick one, but they're all good. So, I don't know. It's, yeah, that is a good counterpoint. Sometimes it just... You just are making a thing, and <laughs> yeah, I guess it's just very different techniques for it. But yep. I guess and it's going to keep too. evolving. You know, animation is just going to get with VR, with all the tools that are being developed that we don't even know about. It's just going to, you know, it's going to be different ten years from now. Yeah, and yeah, that was a good call out with the VR being used to film thing you mentioned. It's pretty cool that it is able to do that so well and VR for animation is a thing that obviously we think makes a lot of sense and it's very yeah. useful so yeah good stuff but yeah so I, I came up with a segment to wrap up the show based on you know gotta jump on the ideal setups of the moment my brain's not fully functioning either so that could have been said better but <laughs> we've got questions for Gruen's delirious sick 101 fever brain so just hit us with your first thought on each of these questions you're ready for it just your first delirious brain thought ready okay yeah <laughs> what should we use for the currency in the metaverse sauerkraut <laughs> if Vera were to have a mascot what should it be um charizard what is the next big invention vr needs uh, flying, flying, actual, like, to feel like you're flying. Yeah, no, those are good. Those are good answers. Especially like using sauerkraut in the metaverse. Honestly, I, I could see, you know, not obviously actual sauerkraut, but just like a name like that, because it's very memorable. You could just call like SK. <laughs> yeah. Some kraut. <laughs> yeah. Jar Did you have answers yeah. for those or no? Uh, I don't know. I didn't come up with answers. I I could see, uh, honestly, a cryptocurrency being the currency in the metaverse. You know, just because if the metaverse is something worldwide, then you can't as easily like you'd have all these foreign transaction fees all the time. But if it's some global crypto, then that makes sense. So uh, I don't know. It'd have to be a stable coin or something, or else it'd be like, I just bought a soda for what was two bucks, and <laughs> I could have had 200 bucks worth of soda. No. The Everybody would have to enter at the same level, because if you started with Bitcoin and you've already got people that are rich, well, they're already going to own the, the metaverse. So you've got to start everybody from the same point and, you know, and it can't become something where some people are, you know, I, you, you don't want to have classes of people in the metaverse. We already have that in the real world. So I hope they figure that out. Like you, you don't want to get that to happen again. So it, it's got to be a new currency. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, I like that where 
It's a only in the metaverse currency. And then, you know, if you want to buy a stapler or whatever, you can use a real currency, but it doesn't. That's going to your real life. And so if you want to buy a new avatar, you have to use your metaverse currency. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. I like it. For the uh, VR mascot, I think a raccoon, because um, it's got like the eyes, like you've been wearing a headset for a long time, you know? Ooh, yeah. I think I think that would work for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but our next big invention VR needs, um, I mean, I, I want to answer haptics, but I think, you know, people are obviously already doing that. I, I think my thing will be, so they've got the treadmill and they've got the little shoes that when you walk they go backwards so you can move around but i don't think either is perfect because like i mean obviously it's not perfect but like you can't crouch with the vr treadmill and it takes up half your room the shoes like anytime i see anyone walking with them it looks like they're putting all their effort into not falling over so i just think an improvement to being able to move around in vr without moving in your room which I think is going to be about as hard as lying. So we both made a hard one, but I think that would be fantastic. So those are my thoughts on the matter. But yeah, very good. I, I, yeah. Think, I think that may just about do it. How about you? Yeah, I'm going to go take some DayQuil and watch a movie. That sounds like a good plan. Thanks any, for any tuning suggestions in. on the Internet. movie? Uh, I think you need to go watch Coco Melon for 12 hours. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right. Thanks for tuning in, Internet. We'll catch you on the next one. Peace. Later.